You seem to have an impossible situation. The Premier of New South Wales is not behaving like a Premier should be. He should be standing up to Canberra, shouldn't he? Yeah, he should. And, and look, David, to be honest with you, I'd like to see the Premiers of Victoria, uh, Brisbane, sorry, Queensland and New South Wales stand up and say, look, you know, Canberra, you're, you're bringing record numbers of, uh, of migrants and you're getting the benefit from it, but we, we're bearing the cost and our residents are bearing the cost and you basically need to pay us $100,000 per, per migrant that settles in our cities. That would be fair to cover their infra infrastructure costs, to cover their, uh, their, their, you know, government services and all the other stuff that's needed. Uh, unfortunately, for some reason, they never do this. And I don't know if it's because of, you know, their, their, uh, their political allegiances. They never do it. And they never stand up to Canberra on this, which they should. But interestingly, David, um, former New South Wales Premier Dominic Perrottet uh, actually fronted the Property Council last week. And he said he told the property council in a speech that that basically Australia's current immigration program is quote a Ponzi scheme and also quote lazy economics and he also uh, lamented the fact that the federal government is getting all the benefits from immigration and that all the costs have been lumped on the state governments and he actually demanded that the federal government compensate the states so I think that's a right the right attitude the problem with it is when Dominic Perrottet was actually Premier, he, he, he towed a very different line. He, he called for more immigration when he took over from Gladys. And uh, he, he, he argued that we needed 2 million migrants in, in five years. Um, and he basically said that the pre-COVID levels of immigration need to be doubled for five years. Well, guess what? The Albanese government did it for one year. And Perrottet realised, oh, hang on, that probably wasn't a very smart call because it's created a rental crisis across Sydney and all these other problems. So... Look, you know, it's a classic case of politicians having a Damascus moment once they leave politics and suddenly becoming honest. But unfortunately, they very rarely do it while they're in office and they don't tell the truth. Isn't there also a wider problem, and that is that uh, immigrants only come to Sydney and Melbourne because they are the only places where they can get jobs? There's no development in Australia outside of the capitals. And the reason there's no development outside of the capitals, as I understand it, is the question of water. When this government got in, this is the federal government got in, they closed off all of the plans for dams, building them or improving them, particularly the one in northern Queensland. They closed them off because Labor is now anti-dams. Ever since Hawke, they've been against dams and they have the power to stop dams all over the country because of the way the High Court has interpreted the Constitution. It seems to be ridiculous that we live on this continent where we're perched into high-rise buildings in Sydney and Melbourne and there's a vast amount of land across the whole of the country. Do, do you think there's something wrong there in relation to the water policy of this country? Oh, 100%. I mean, look, the, 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 the whole thing is we live on, we live on the driest continent on, on Earth, so we can't actually sustain a massive population. And you certainly... Um, you know, unless you want to build a battery of desalination plants up and down the coast, which of course use a ton of energy uh, and are very incredibly expensive to operate, you need to build a whole lot of infrastructure for it. So the the way we've set it up at the moment, David, and this is the most ridiculous thing, is we're dumping, so take Sydney, for example, we're dumping most of the migrants in Western Sydney, which are 30 to 50 kilometres away from the coast, where we're going to have water shortage. It's also the hottest part of Sydney. And the solution is going to have to be basically building a whole battery of desalination plants and then pumping the water against gravity uphill about 30, you know, 30 to 50 kilometres inland uh, via pipelines that will have to be built underground because there's already built out with properties. It's going to be going to cost absolutely billions and billions and billions of dollars, right? And no, no consideration is ever given to this sort of stuff, what, they, what, what the cost is going to be to build these things to run them, what it's going to do to our water bills, all that sort of thing. Basically, we just bring in the people and we worry about the consequences later. Well, we don't actually, we, we, we don't even worry about it. We just let it happen. Um, and, and, and that's just, you know, I, I see a massive problem for Australia in the next, you know, 40 years, for example, uh, running this policy because uh, if all the people pontificated about climate change are correct, we're going to have a massive fall in rainfall, uh, you know, we're going to have less water supply. 
So the notion of roughly doubling the population and expecting to somehow provide water to that population is delusional. It's going to cost bucket loads of money to do it. And so, and then, and then, then that brings you to the uh, the whole issue of this net zero. How are you going to need, achieve net zero when you've got energy guzzling desalination plants up and down the coast that 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 need a ton of energy to to operate? It's just the, the whole thing is just silly. And all most of these problems could be avoided by simply not 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 importing so many people in the first place. I just well, run a sensible, sustainable immigration program. That's so. And uh, I would say one of the restrictions, which they seem to have ignored, is that you you don't import people who bring with them the the hatreds that they've had over centuries and try to apply them here. You you bring people who are going to be good migrants and who are not going to bring their ancient hatreds to Australia. But getting back to water, my colleague Alan Jones has long argued. He's argued that uh, we have all the water we need in Australia, just falls in the wrong places. And he follows in the tradition of Bradfield, the builder of the Sydney Harbour Bridge, and Beale, who was very interested in moving the Clarence, and Ernie Bridges, who was an Indigenous minister in Western Australia who wanted to build uh, tunnels to bring water down from the north of, of Western Australia into the south. He argues that you can, we can have sufficient water in this country where we need it, provided that we're willing to adopt what has been proposed in the past, but also that we go into the sort of recycling that Singapore does. Singapore now recycles all of its water and does it very well so that the water is a very high standard. And he says we don't do enough of that. Is this also something which should be looked at by governments rather than worrying about uh, climate change, which doesn't seem to come? Yeah, look, certainly, I mean, the, the water issue can be solved through technolog te technology and, uh, you know, if you want to build massive pipelines, et cetera. But the thing about it is all those solutions are very expensive, right? Like oh, it, yes. It's going to cost, it'll cost a lot of money to do it. So desalinated water costs about five times as much as, you know, traditional water. Um, recycled water is, you know, multiples as well. And then obviously the, the cost of building a pipeline from Northern Australia to, you know, Sydney and Melbourne, for example, or Adelaide, it would, would cost a lot of money. It can all be done. But my, my, my bigger issue is why create the problem in the first place? Like, like why, why create all this extra demand for water uh, by, you know, doubling the population over, say, 50 years if you, did, if you don't need to double the population over 50 years? Um, I've, I've done uh, that, back that, of that's, the... That's just, a big just, issue. Just interrupting you on this. I've done back of the envelope calculations and I worked out that if West, Western Australia were a separate country and occasionally they do go that way, in fact, they were reluctant members of the Federation, probably the only reason they joined was because sufficient numbers of people moved from the eastern states because of the, the gold rush in Kalgoorlie and Coolgardie they moved in and they were sufficient in numbers to change the vote at the time of the referendums for federation. But if Western Australia with its small population were a separate country and with its massive resources, it would be, probably be the wealthiest country in the world today. And you don't need a big population to be successful. Singapore is a, a good example of that or Norway or the Netherlands, you don't need a big population to be a successful country. And I think you're, you're right to say, why have this enormous immigration, which is pointless? Yeah, look, I, I'd, I'd like to see Australia follow the Norway approach, to be quite frank. I mean, I mean Norway's uh, taxes, it's, it's got about five, about, about the same population as Melbourne or Sydney. It's just, you know, about five and a half million people. Um, and it has, you know, lots of gas and oil, oil uh, reserves. And unlike Australia and unlike, you know, the UK and a lot of other countries, it actually uh, has kept their refineries and their oil and gas companies mostly in public hands, so they're government owned. And also um, the, the private operators of taxes incredibly high. And what that's meant is that basically they, they earn enormous tax revenue from their, from their uh, uh, oil and gas exports. And that's basically created a sovereign wealth fund that's now worth about 250,000 US dollars per resident, per citizen. Now, 
that, that's made Norway incredibly, incredibly rich. It's also given them a disincentive to grow their population aggressively by population because as soon as you do that, you, you basically dilute your wealth amongst more people. Australia does the opposite of Norway. We don't tax our resources properly. Um, we, we don't raise nearly enough revenue from it. And then we import huge numbers of people then dilute our mineral wealth so that the little that we do get as residents is then diluted amongst, divided amongst more people. So we do everything back to front in this country. And we, I'd argue that we'd be a richer country with actually, uh, you know, at, at 20 million people than we are at 27 million people because we'd be spreading our mineral wealth over less, uh, less numbers. And also, obviously, you know, we should be taxing our, our mineral uh, exports properly and copying the sort of Norway approach. Leith, on that very sound advice, I'd like to thank you and thank you for your, what you're doing for this country and giving this unconventional economic advice. You're from macrobusiness.com.au, a very valuable site, and you can subscribe for even more incredible advice and very useful advice. Thank you so much, Leith. Thanks, David. Speak to you next time.